I want to talk football starting out, okay? I'm not going to talk about the game last night, although I heard it was a barn burner, all right? Uh, I want to talk about a guy named Tim Tebow. On January 8th, 2009, Tim Tebow was the most famous football player in collegiate football at the time. He was leading his team in the national championship game. And Tebow was known as a Christian uh, during this season. And he would often write Bible verses on the black makeup underneath of his eyes. And on this particular game, the national championship game, Tebow, the most famous football player in college at that time, wrote the most famous verse of scripture underneath of his eyes on his eye makeup, John 3, 16. The Gators won the game in the national championship. Coincidence? (laughs) Maybe, 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 maybe. What was interesting though, was over the next 24 hours, the number one trending topic on Facebook, Twitter, and on Google was John 3.16. Over 93 million people, individuals, Googled John 3.16. Someone has pointed out that if they had to Google it, they probably didn't know what it said. And therefore, most people think millions of people heard the gospel or read it at least for the first time, maybe in their lives, simply because Tim Tebow wrote John 3.16 on his eye makeup. Pretty interesting, pretty interesting. The story gets interesting three years later to the day, January 8th, 2012, Tebow was leading the Denver Broncos in his very first NFL playoff game. They ended up winning the game. And when he was going from the locker room to the press conference, he was interrupted by the, uh, or, or interceded maybe, Inter- intervened by the, uh, the VP of public relations for the Denver Broncos, a guy named Patrick Smith. And he said, Timmy, do you realize what just happened? And Tebow said, yes, we beat the Steelers and we are going to play the Patriots in our next game. And he says, no, no, you don't understand. It's exactly three years to the day since your national championship game when you wrote John 3.16 on your, on your eye makeup. And Tebow was like, okay, you're gonna have to tell me why that's so special right now. And he went on to tell him what had happened in that playoff game. Tebow threw for 316 yards in that game. He set an NFL uh, playoff game record with 31.6 yards per completion. His rushing yards in the, per carry were 3.16. The time of possession uh, was 31.6 minutes. And the Nielsen TV ratings for the game peaked at 31.6. Now because of that, and because it was pointed out in the press conference, again, exactly three years later, the number one trending topic on Facebook and Twitter and the number one Google search over the next 24 hours was John 3 16. Tebow's been asked many times about that, that eerie circumstance. And this is what he said on one well-known talk show. He said, a lot of people say it's a coincidence. I say big God. I want to talk to you today about prayer. And a lot of people in our culture would say answered prayer is a coincidence. A lot of people would even say life itself is just one big coincidence. I'm here to tell you today, I think not. And I think a man in the Bible named Mordecai and his daughter, Queen Esther, would agree with me. And I want to show you what I'm talking about as we pick up their story in Esther chapter 6 as we continue in this series. So if you have a Bible and want to turn there and follow along with us, We've been talking about prayer in this series from a unique perspective using the story of Esther as a parable for our prayer lives because Esther was queen and she and her dad were facing the biggest storm they'd ever faced in their lives. A genocide law had been signed into effect. A date had been set, which was their death sentence. And so they got together and they said, we need to fast and pray for three days. And at the end of those three days, Esther literally stormed the throne of King Xerxes, who was king over the the kingdom at that time. She went uninvited and unannounced, which was a, a crime punishable by death at that time. 
to beg for her life. And when she came into the throne room of the king, he extended his scepter, which was his favor, that he would listen to her plea. And she came to him. And before she could even ask and make her petition, he gave his answer in advance. And he said, whatever you're gonna ask, it will be done for you up to half my kingdom. It was a sign of his favor. And we've been talking about in this series how our king, Jesus, the king of all kings, the king of heaven, has given us a similar promise in prayer. He said, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. If you ask anything in my name, it will be done for you. In John 14, verse 13. It's a massive promise concerning prayer from Jesus. And as Hebrews 4, 16 says, therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness to receive grace and mercy in our time of need. God is our father and he delights to answer our prayers. But that's not the only lesson that we could learn from Esther. This story is packed with par uh, a parable uh, of a lesson, lesson upon lesson for our prayer lives. And I wanna pick up the story today and I wanna talk about how God answers prayer. Last week, we, we left off in Esther chapter five. Esther, the, the king answers her in advance. She says to him, okay, if it pleases the king, come to a banquet later today and, and, and I'll tell you what I want. And so they come and they eat. And at the end of the banquet, he goes, okay. And he repeats his answer. Whatever you're gonna ask for, it's gonna be done for you. And, and she's, she's, we're not sure why, but she doesn't feel ready yet to tell him what's going on. And so she says, here's my petition. If it pleases the king, come to a banquet tomorrow, you and Haman, and then I'll make my request. Now, Haman is the bad guy. He is the one who hates God's people. He's the one who's deceived the king into signing this law into effect. The king doesn't really realize what's going on. And so Haman goes out that day from banquet number one, thinking he's got the favor of the king and the favor of the queen now, and that they're throwing these banquets and he's the only one invited. He feels so honored. He has no idea that Esther the next day is gonna rat him out and that the king's gonna become aware of his plan. And so last week we talked about how he went home and on his way, he saw Mordecai, Esther's dad, and he wouldn't honor him. And he got upset and he's telling his wife, like, I've got everything, but I can't enjoy it because of this man. And so his wife and his advisors say, here's what you do, build a gallows, but not to hang him, put a pole on it, 50 cubits high with a sharp point, and then you'll set him on it and you'll impale him, and then he'll die a slow, agonizing death. And so that night, okay, that night, he builds the gallows, he builds the pole, and he's going to go the next morning to talk to the king about letting him execute Mordecai. And in chapter six, verse one, something amazing happens that very night, the night between the two banquets, the night before the plan is going to be revealed, something happens. The timing is impeccable. You guys aren't gonna believe this. Esther six, verse one, it's so mind blowing. I don't even know what I'm gonna do. I just have to read it right now. You guys won't believe this. It's so awesome. Esther six, verse one, it says, that night the king could not sleep. Isn't that amazing? Wow! Holy cow, can you believe it? The king could not sleep. Some of you are like, what's the big deal? I couldn't sleep last night, all right? I ate too much pizza, watching that game, staying up, seeing what was gonna happen. And I couldn't, I couldn't fall asleep. What's the big deal? I can't sleep all the time. As we go through the rest of this story today, I want you to notice what happens because the king could not sleep that night. It, the rest of verse one says, that night the king could not sleep. So he ordered the book of Chronicles, the record of his reign to be brought in and read to him. Okay, story time with King Xerxes. He's chosen the book, the Chronicles of his kingdom. Chronicles were a history, a historical account of what was happening in his kingdom. So much was going on, his kingdom was so massive, he would make a lot of decisions, lots of other people made decisions, a lot was going on, and they would record everything in the book of Chronicles. You have a book of first and second Chronicles in the Old Testament of your Bible, that was the Chronicles of the kings of Judah and Israel, the kings of God's people. This was his book of Chronicles. And so you guys have experienced what he's doing, right? You experienced this like in high school like I did, right? You fell asleep in history class almost every day, right? Why? Let's just admit it. 
history can be really boring, okay? And so he's like, I can't sleep. Bring out the Chronicles and just read to me and let's see if that helps. And listen to what happens. The person begins reading to him the record of his reign. In verse two, it was found recorded there that Mordecai, Esther's dad, had exposed Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. Now Xerxes knew about this plan. He became aware of it. We know that from chapter three, but he didn't know that it was Mordecai who had overheard the plan. It was Mordecai who ratted these traitors out but the king became aware of it and he executed them and took care of this assassination plot. What he didn't know until this moment was that Mordecai was the one who saved his life. And so he's being read this historical account, maybe just trying to fall back asleep, but he goes, oh my goodness, I owe this Mordecai my life. In this moment, he becomes aware that Mordecai is a good guy. He becomes aware that Mordecai is on his side and he owes Mordecai his life. So verse three, he says, what honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked, nothing has been done for him. His attendants answered. And in that moment, something happens. Right as he finds out that Mordecai is a good guy, that Mordecai is on his side, verse four says, the king said, who's in the court? He heard somebody was in the outer court. Somebody was there. Now Haman The bad guy, the one who deceived him into signing into effect this genocide law, had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about impaling Mordecai on the pole he had set up for him. Are you guys catching the drift of what's happening and the timing of all of this? Mordecai or Haman is planning to kill a guy named Mordecai. He sets up the gallows, the pole to impale him on. The next morning, he's going to go talk to the king to get permission to execute him. And that night, the king discovers who Mordecai really is. He discovers that he's on his side. It's a setup. It's a setup for a twist in the plot. The rest of the story just preaches itself. And I want to read it to you because it's awesome. Verse five, it says, his attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Well, bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? You see, Haman had an agenda. He wanted to go and talk to the king about his agenda. But when he came in, the king doesn't even care about that. He's like, hey, listen, I, I heard something. And Haman's his number, number, number one guy. He's second in command of the whole kingdom. He was a guy that he would get advice from often, one of his main advisors. And so he's like, I don't really care why you're here, but I want to ask you something. What should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought to himself, I love this part, who is there that the king would rather honor than me? (laughs) And so this is how he answers the king. For the man the king delights to honor, here's what you do. Have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and the horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let the let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse through the city. You get the, you get the picture as he's going through this. He can see himself riding the horse with the robe on like, yes, laud me, laud me with praise and honor, right? And he's going through this. He's like, this is what you should do and have him lead him through the streets. This is what should be done. And have, have the guy lead him say, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. And so the king replies in verse 10, go at once. He's thinking, that's a great idea. Go at once, get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, This is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. (laughs) And after Haman had eaten some humble pie, sorry, that's my interjection. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief. And he told Zeresh, his wife, and all of his friends, everything that had happened to him. His advisors and his wife, Zeresh, 
said to him, since Mordecai before whom your downfall has started is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. They're saying the king has discovered Mordecai is a Jew and Mordecai saved his life. And he's gonna realize that this law that was signed is wrong and he's, it's, it's not gonna work out for, for you. And verse 14 is just packed with foreshadowing while they were still talking to him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Esther had prepared. Dun, dun, dun. Right? Because it's at that banquet that Esther's going to reveal the evil plan. And because the king had realized that Mordecai was on his side, when Esther tells him what's going on, he knows instantly she's right. And he ends up having Haman executed on the gallows he set up for Mordecai. And we can trace this huge twist in the plot, this miracle that occurs. I mean, the, the, the enemy had one plan that he was working out and it just gets flipped on its head and the enemy ends up getting what he deserved and God's people end up winning the battle. It's a miracle. It is such a, such a twist in the plot. And we can trace it all back to one little verse in chapter six. That night, the king could not sleep. Coincidence? I think not. See, most scholars believe that Mordecai wrote the book of Esther. Like later in his life, at the end of his life, maybe he's looking back and he's like, people have to know this story. And he just begins writing the story and recording the account. And I have to imagine Mordecai gets to chapter six and he's like, what if, what if people told me in my research happened? Oh yeah, that night the king couldn't sleep. Oh my goodness. And he realizes that was the reason that the plot got flipped and that the miracle happened. And I imagine he writes that verse and he just sits back in wonder and in awe of what God was doing. But I, I don't think he thought it was a coincidence. You know why? Because in ancient Hebrew, which was the language that Mordecai wrote Esther in, the language of the Old Testament, the first language of God, there is literally no word for coincidence. It doesn't exist in their language. The ancient rabbis took this prophetically and would say, as we would say in our culture, everything happens for a reason. They've come to say it this way, coincidence is not a kosher word. And so that night the king couldn't sleep. Was it a coincidence? No, it was providence. It was a providential answer to prayer that I believe we can trace back to Esther chapter four. That's when Mordecai had learned of the plot and he sent servants to Esther to tell her. And he said to her, you're the queen now. You've got to go into the king. You've got to storm his throne. You've got to tell him what's going on and you've got to beg for our lives. And she sends word back and says that I can't do that. I could be killed. And he sends people back in the famous verse in Esther four. He's like, you were born for such a time as this. Who knows you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You've got to go. You've got to do this. And so she sends word back in Esther four, verse 16. If you recall that verse, she said, okay, here's what you do. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, which is the capital city and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days. Night or day, I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king. It's implied that they were fasting and praying night and day. And so if you're Esther and Mordecai, especially Esther, if you, if you know that in three days, you're gonna go into the throne room of the king and you could be killed on the spot for coming uninvited, I'm gonna guess maybe you don't get as much sleep as you normally would. You're fasting, you're praying. And imagine this, on these sleepless nights, they're offering up prayers, they're storming the throne of heaven. And the king of heaven, who the Bible says never sleeps, 
is hearing their petitions and requests and, and they're asking him to answer and to show favor. And he says, you know, I'm gonna answer this prayer. And so he says, hey, Gabriel, I want you to go down to the king of earth, Xerxes, and three nights from now, I want you to give him a slight case of insomnia. And so that night, the king couldn't sleep and he discovered that Mordecai was on his side and it set the people of God up for the biggest miracle of their generation. It wasn't a coincidence. It was a providential answer to prayer. William Temple, who was a well-known English bishop, once replied to his critics who regarded answered prayer as no more than coincidence. He said it this way, when I pray, coincidences happen. When I don't, they don't. I'm here to tell you today, it's not a coincidence, it's providence. Look at the person sitting next to you and tell them, it's not a coincidence, it's providence. <laughs> providence is defined as the foreseeing care and guidance of God, the manifestation of divine care or direction, timely preparation for future eventualities. That's providence. But the thing about providence is you often can't see it happening when you're in it. Because as Einstein said, coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. I would say it this way, providence is God's way of answering prayers and remaining anonymous. You can't see it while you're in it. He's moving, but there's a lot of moving parts in providence. There's time, there's circumstances, there's situations, there's experiences, there's relationships, what we would come to call in modern Christendom, divine appointments. And God's working it all together. And sometimes you can be in the midst of an answered prayer and not even realize it until years later when you're through that season and you look back and you see God's fingerprints all over your life. I was thinking about that this week and I looked back on my life and I see God's providence all over the place. I wrote two or three pages worth of God's providence in my life and I was like, we're gonna be here for like three hours. I can't, I can't share all of this, but I felt led to share part of my story this week. See, back in 2003, 2004, I was in college at Indiana Wesleyan University and I was begging God to show me what I should do about my major because my freshman year I was a music major, but I gave up on that because I, the only way you could, the career path that the trajectory that that major had was like uh, music education in schools, like being a band director. And I wanted no part of that. Like I wanted to be like a rock star, you know, like the next Van Halen. And so I was like, I, I don't want to do that. And I kind of realized that. And I realized like, I'm passionate about music. I'm going to do that on my own. I don't need to go to school for it, you know? And so I was like, I'm, I'm going to do something else with college and just do music on my own. But I was, I was begging God. I'd, I'd just come back to God recently and I was trying to follow him passionately. And I have this one memory where we're standing I was standing in our student center at the college and I just gotten some mail from the, the campus mailboxes and I turned around and I, I don't remember what was going on that day. I just know that in my heart, I, there was a storm inside of me brewing because I had picked a major, but I was really unsure about it. I didn't know what to do. I had to declare it was, it was my junior year. Yes, I was a junior and still had not declared a major. And so I had taken a, a leadership course. It was a new line of courses at the college and it was studying organizational leadership, leadership theory, but then you'd have to do projects in the community and in the school and you'd have to get people to, to do your projects with you and, and you'd have to manage and you'd have to lead. And it was, it was like practical stuff too. And I was like, man, this is just fun. I love learning about leadership. So I'm gonna pick that, you know? And they had just made it a major. And so I was like, I guess I'm gonna declare this. And I remember standing at the mailboxes that day and I was so unsure of it. And I had been praying for God to give me guidance, give me wisdom. And I felt like he was completely silent at that time. And I was just like, God, why won't you answer me? I need you to answer me. Show me what to do. Is this the right major for me or not? And I just felt like it was total silence. And so I just 
kept plotting away. One of my mentors told me, hey, you know, if it's, if it's not a moral decision, if it's a choice between two good things and, and it feels like God's not answering, then just do what you think and just keep doing what you're doing. And that probably means God's like, yeah, that's the right path. And so I was like, okay. And I, I just, I felt like I was making a mistake and I didn't want to screw up. I, I saw God so much in that season. I just felt like he wasn't answering in a loud way. And uh, graduated college, married my, my high school sweetheart and we moved back here and we started probably the hardest year of our lives. Um, because the thing about a leadership degree was it's kind of like a general business degree. There's a, you can do so many things with it. Okay, young people, if you're in college and they tell you, you can do so many things with this degree, just run for your life, okay? <laughs> what that means is, let me translate, there's not a defined clear path and it's gonna be really, uh, really hard to get a job, okay? And that's what I experienced. And I, was, I applied for jobs in that year in every, pretty much every major sector uh, education. I was like, yeah, I could be a teacher. Every job I was like, yeah, I could do this. I could get excited about this, you know? And I, I applied for teaching jobs. I applied uh, for sales, uh, retail. I could have been a Kroger store manager at Kroger, you know, like uh, the healthcare uh, industry, you know? Everything, I was, I was trying everything, uh, the financial sector. I would get two and three interviews down the road and, and they would, all of them, we love you, you're great. We're just looking for somebody with more experience. You know, maybe if your degree was more in line with, <laughs> with, <laughs> with what this is. And I was just like so frustrated. I was like, God. And it was in that season, seeking God a lot, that hard season, he, I felt like he was leading me to ministry. Now, I got a little upset about that. Cause I was like, I was really seeking you a few years ago. Why didn't you tell me back in college that day at the mailboxes when I'm praying and I could have changed my major to like ministry or, or biblical studies. Why didn't you do that? I was frustrated, but I was feeling pulled towards, towards ministry. Around that time I was journaling, you know, doing my daily devotions and I would journal just a, just a little bit. But this one particular day, kind of out of nowhere, I was thinking about those experiences in my life, how this teenage college season is so important in the lives of young people because they make so many decisions, both morally and with their careers that, that affect the rest of their lives. And I was journaling about this and I'm like, oh, this is so important. Oh, you gotta love Jesus. You know, you do. and I'm just like, Ugh. and And that day my journaling went from just writing a few thoughts like usual to like, I ended up writing four or five pages of notes. And it, my, the voice of my writing changed at the beginning from just my thoughts to like, I'm saying, it was like first person I'm saying this to young people. And I got to the end, there's like four or five pages. And I'm like, this is like a, I, I like couldn't bring myself to say the word sermon, you know? Cause I was like, I want nothing to do with that, you know? But I was like, young people need to hear this. I feel like I'm supposed to say it to them, like give a talk to young people. And so, I called up one of my friends at the time who uh, it was a few years older than me, he, just a very wise person, may, always made good decisions. And he was a worship leader at another church at the time. And I called him up and I said, hey man, I wrote all this stuff out. Like, I feel like I'm supposed to say it to like teenagers or something. What, what do you think I should do? And he goes, well, it's funny you should mention this because you know our mutual friend so-and-so? I was like, yeah. And, and they were people I'd known a few years ago, but I hadn't really seen them in a while. He goes, well, they're at this other church now and they're, they're starting a youth service once a month on Saturday nights and it's just starting next month and they're looking for someone to talk at it. Maybe you're supposed to go talk at that. And I was like, maybe, uh, thanks man. You know? And so I called them up. I said, hey, it's me, I haven't talked to you in a while. Uh, heard you guys are starting this youth thing. Well, I just had this weird experience and I told them what happened. I was like, I feel like I'm supposed to say it to young people. like could I come and say this to your all's teenagers? And, and looking back, I just praise the Lord that we were all so young and naive. There was no background check or like how many times have you spoken and what's your experience? <laughs> it was like, sure, you can come. Yeah, you'll be the first one. And, and you play music too, right? You can lead the music and then you can preach. And so I showed up at this youth event and I had prepared like three songs. It's just me and acoustic. And, and it was so terrible. Uh, the music, because I was so nervous. I'd never spoken before. The whole time, I'm just thinking about what I'm going to say. And I'm just like, and, and I think I even cut it a song short, because I was like, let's just get this over with and just be done with this, okay? And I stepped up, and I had those notes. And I read the first few sentences. And then my heart just broke for these kids. 
And I was like, they need to hear this. And I, I quit looking at the notes and I just began speaking my heart to these kids. And I taught, I don't remember what I said, just talked for 30 minutes about Jesus and him and following him and making good decisions and just poured my heart out. And at the end, the kids were emotional. I was emotional. Like I had this out of body, in body experience that night where it was the first time I'd ever spoken to any group of people about anything, uh, let alone God. And so as I was preaching and speaking that whole time, I was like in awe of what was happening because it was like, the only way I can explain it is like, God put me on like a glove and he started saying things through me. And half the stuff I said, I was like, I did not write this. When did I study this? I don't know what I'm talking about, but it's amazing, right? And my brain's over here going, wow, wow, this is amazing. This is awesome. And I got done and I just had this sense like, I don't know what just happened, but I liked it and that was awesome. I felt used by God, you know? And I talked to the leaders afterwards and I said, hey, you guys need next month? And they're like, yeah, we do. You wanna come back next month? That was great. I was like, sure. And so I'd wised up a little bit and I called my worship leader friend and I said, hey, why don't you bring your band and you all lead worship for these teenagers? And then I'll, I'll preach and we did it last month and, and it went awesome, man, but, but why don't you come? And he's like, all right. And he had this awesome band, full band, similar to what we're doing uh, here at Resonance now. And it was awesome. And that second time sitting in the audience that night, I'm sitting in like a crowd of teenagers and I'm watching my friend lead worship. And the cry of my heart was like, God, can't we do church like this every week? Because no churches at that time were like doing that type of church that connected with young people, that was simple. I just wanted to forget about the traditions and all the rules and all that. Like, let's just play normal music that people listen to that talks about Jesus, right? And, and, and then I'll just get up and speak, you know? And that's how I'm thinking, I'm like, this is so awesome. And I was like, God, can we do church like this every week? And then a few months later, I moved to Detroit, Michigan. And that was the last time I spoke there and uh, became a worship leader up there. And our first staff meeting in that church, my pastor looked at me and he goes, you know, Aaron, every six to eight weeks, I like to take a break. He's like, would you ever want to preach here? And it was crazy. I remember sitting in that staff meeting and I was, I was like, man, if he had asked me that three months ago, I would have said, no way, I'm not a preacher. But because I had spoken at those youth events and I had the experience I did, I was like, I think God wants me to do this. And so I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll preach here. And he's like, all right. And he made the first sermon like a month later. I was like, wow. And I began preaching every six to eight weeks and getting experience. The end of that year, I'd been there about a year and we, we all went to a conference together, the staff members of that church. They bought group tickets. And because we bought group tickets, we got one free ticket to this conference. And the other guys were older and like grizzled men, ministry veterans, as I would say, you know. And uh, none of them wanted to go to this pre-conference intensive, they called it, which is what the free ticket was for. And so they're like, we're here day early. We're all gonna go see the city. Does anybody wanna, anybody wanna go to this? And we have this one free ticket. And I was new to ministry. I was trying to soak up everything and learn everything. I was like, I'll go. I was like, I don't even know what it is. They're like, we don't know what it is. Here, you can go. It was like your parents dropping you off at school. You know, the other <laughs> pastors are like, go have fun at your conference, you know? And, and then they, they went and had fun in Atlanta, you know? And, and I walked in, I was like, hey, I'm here for the pre-conference intensive. And I got signed up, like, yeah, it's right in there. Had no idea what it was about. I went in and I sat down. Do you know what the topic of that pre-conference intensive was? Church planning, starting new churches, which I'd never heard about before because the churches I'd been a part of growing up, pretty much all of them were started in literally like the 1800s. And it never occurred to me, somebody had to start that thing. <laughs> and the two of the nation's leaders in church planning spoke back to back that day, full like eight hour day. And it was just like download. It was like, I was in the matrix, I'm Neo. And they're just downloading <laughs> church planning into my soul. And I was just like, whoa. And I was just like, oh, you know, this is amazing. And they started quoting statistics, proven fact that by far and away, the most effective way to reach new people and make disciples of Jesus is starting new churches. And they each told story after story, after God story, after God story, after God story. And I was just like, oh my goodness, more people need to do this. This is amazing. 
And it laid a foundation in my life. A few months later, I read Matthew 28, the Great Commission. And Jesus spoke to me in a powerful way and said, I want you to go start a church. And I randomly ended up at this conference. Had no idea what it would be about. Some people will say, that's a coincidence. I would say, I think not. Because when we came to start Resonance, do you know who was a part of our original team that helped start our church? That friend of mine that I called for advice that led worship that night with those teenagers, he led worship for us this morning. His name's Josh Young. We hired him a year ago full-time as our executive pastor, and I get advice from him every single week now. Our mutual friends that we called, Stasha and Kenton Bailey, they helped start our church. They helped create this environment that we experience every Sunday. Tasha was our first Res Kids director. She's now our guest services director. Kenton's been our sound guy since the beginning. And I think back on that, looking back on that season, looking back on my journey, when I'm standing in a crowd of teenagers and it hit me this week, I'm watching my friend Josh lead worship and I'm like, God, can't we do church like this every week? And I didn't even know it, but he answered that prayer in that moment. And his answer was, yes, I'm answering it right now. I'm arranging times and seasons and circumstances and people and experience and relationships. It's called providence. And the thing about providence is you often can't see it when you're in it. But God was answering that prayer, even though I couldn't see it. Prayer sets the divine appointments of providence. When we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. And he starts arranging the big picture. And I want to encourage some of you, because we've been praying through this series, and you're like, I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't even see if God is working. And I'm telling you, right now, today in your life, God is in the process. He is actively in the midst of answering your prayers and my prayers. I got absolutely convinced of this this past weekend, the past two days. You see, God changed the end of my sermon. I just love it when that happens as someone who likes to plan and be prepared. I finished this sermon like a week ago. I really finished it Thursday. I usually work Fridays. I'd taken Friday off because I had previous plans to go to Marion, Indiana, which is where I went to college. But I was meeting a friend there and we were gonna record some music for two days. And I was gonna be there all day Friday and all day Saturday. And so I finished up. Everything I've told you to this point, I had already written into my notes. I was planning on telling you and preaching this sermon. And I drove to Marion to record some music. I got up uh, Saturday morning. I did my little devotion. I wrote my prayer journal and I wanted some coffee, you know? And so I felt like the Lord was saying, go over to the college and get your coffee this morning. And I was kind of tight on my time schedule. And so I was like, ah, there's a Starbucks on the way. I don't really want to go to the college. Like I had not been to the college since I graduated. It's been like 11 years. And so I was like, I don't really have time. And I felt like God said, go to the college to get your coffee. You're going to see an old friend. And then I really didn't want to go because I was like, I don't have time to see an old friend if I haven't seen him in 10 years. And they'd be like, how are you? I'll be like, I'm great. I got to go, you know, see ya. And I was like, I just, uh, just felt like, just go, just go to college. It's like, okay. So I went to the college to get my coffee. I got there about 10 minutes early. The coffee shop hadn't opened yet. So I had nothing to do. And it dawned on me, I'm like, oh, I'm kind of talking about a few college experiences in my sermon. And I turn and I look and I have a picture. This is a picture kind of close to the coffee shop looking down the hallway. And here on the left are those mailboxes I told you about. And I was standing about right here when I was praying that day that I remember so vividly. And I just got my mail and turned around. I was looking at these walls and I just felt this pull like you got some time. Why don't you go stand down there? you should just go stand in that moment. Just, just kind of remember. And so I walked down there and I stood in that spot and I looked to my left and I was like, yeah, not much has changed. And I turned around and instantly I noticed they had redecorated since I had been there. 
and they had these Bible verses. And this is the first one I saw. And instantly my eyes zoomed in to what it said there, called to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, all things work to the good of those who are called according to God's purpose. And instantly I just started getting so emotional because I realized in that moment that I was begging God 11, 12 years ago in that very spot to give me direction for life, to show me which major to pick. He led me into ministry and I was kind of upset. Like, why didn't you, why didn't you speak to me when I was by those mailboxes to tell me to change? And I realized in that moment, and I've told people this over the years that I love theology. I love the Bible. I read commentaries for fun. And so God knew I didn't need a seminary degree. I would get that on my own, you know? He's like, I want you to study this leadership thing because he knew one day when you start a church, that's gonna be a lot more helpful for you, <laughs> knowing how to organize people and do something and start something than doing something else that you already love and you'll do on your own. And I just got so emotional. I was like, wow, that's amazing. And then I felt this pull to like go upstairs because upstairs there's this one memory that I have that's really, really poignant in my mind. It was our junior year and my girlfriend and I at the time were sitting overlooking the commons area. I think we have a picture. I went upstairs and I took this picture and we were overlooking the commons area one day around lunchtime. We're sitting in this very spot where I was standing and we were talking about when we should get married and we were like, oh, it's probably gonna have to be after we finish college. And the longer we talked, the longer it was gonna be. And we started getting really, really discouraged. And we're like, well, maybe we could do it like this summer before our senior year. We're like, no, that's not gonna work. The financial piece of things. And we're both like still on our parents. You know, they, they judge our financial aid off of our parents and all that. And it probably wouldn't even work if we got married. And so we're probably just not, and we're just talking about like, oh, this is so hard. Why do we have to wait and all this? And while we're talking about it, two of our friends walk up these steps and they start walking and they had just gotten married right before that year of college. And we're like, well, there's, there's so-and-so. They just got married. They're doing it. Let's go see what, what they're doing. Let's see what it's like. And so we went and talked to them. And we're like, how, are you guys, how did you guys do this before finishing school and getting jobs? And they're like, well, actually, you know, they were judging off of our parents' income. When you get married, you're poor, you got nothing. And so they'll give you more financial aid. And so it's totally possible. And we were like, oh my goodness, you know, we could do this. And we made the decision that day, like let's plan on getting married the summer before our senior year. I was on the way to church this morning. I was telling my daughter Isabel that story because we got married before our senior year and five months in, we got pregnant, which was not the plan. But I realized if we hadn't got married our senior year, Bell would not exist. And I was just like, wow, this is so awesome, you know? And I was looking at this and I was like, wow, God, you were there in that moment. And I didn't even know, but you were arranging people and you kind of knew what was gonna happen and, and who was gonna walk up. And maybe, maybe your spirit was even there like saying, hey, you should talk about getting married right now so that we would be aware of, like, wow, you were orchestrating. And then I kid you not, I turn around and there's a wall and there's another plaque with the scripture verse on it. And it says, acknowledge him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. He'll direct you when you pray and when you acknowledge him, he'll start directing things and people and circumstances and divine appointments to bring you into his will for your life. And I was like, wow, God, you were in that moment. You were there by those mailboxes. And you were here. This is so amazing. Wow. I want some coffee. <laughs> That's what I thought. And so I went downstairs and they were finally open. And I was so emotional. The barista's like, what would you like? And I was like, don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. I just want some coffee. <laughs> you know? She's like, enjoy your day. Or no, enjoy every day. And I was like, <laughs> like, don't look in her eyes, you know, you'll ball like a baby. And so I got the coffee and I'm walking out and I'm just overwhelmed emotionally. I'm like, this is amazing. And I'm walking out and I'm like, I gotta get going. And then it dawns on me, like, I didn't see the friend. Who was the friend? And the, the campus was dead. There was like 10 people in the, whole, in the whole building, you know? And I'm like, there's no one here. Who am I gonna see? And I was like, well, I'll give it like five minutes. So I sit down in the commons area and I'm sitting there, I'm waiting. <laughs> Like, I don't think anybody's coming. This is so weird. Thought that was God for sure. And 
I'm thinking about what happened. I'm like, man, God, you were there by those mailboxes. and Man, you were there up there that day talking about when we should get married. And man, you were there. And he goes, yeah, see me now? <laughs> now that you're through it, looking back, couldn't see it then. But you see now I was there and it hit me like a ton of bricks. God was like, I'm the friend. I'm the old friend. And I was there that day by those mailboxes. And you prayed, and I was so proud of you. You were seeking me, and you were doing what I wanted. And I was like, yeah, you use that leadership degree, keep going. And I was there that day with your wife, and I was arranging the timing of your marriage because I knew what needed to happen. And I got the sense he was reliving these memories with me, rejoicing like a friend, going, remember that? Remember when we were talking? about your major? Remember when we talked about that? Remember when we all were talking about your marriage? And remember, because that's what prayer is. It's talking to God about, about things. And it's like he was rejoicing over it. He's like, look at where you've come. Wow, I was there all along. And I was just a mess. I was overwhelmed. I was like, oh, God's my friend, you know? <laughs> I didn't say that verbally, but I was feeling it. I was like, Whoa gosh, don't look at anyone else, you know, like you'll just bawl. And so I went to my car and I drove to my friend's house and we were supposed to record music that day. And I got there and I walked into, into his house and uh, he's cooking breakfast. And he turns around, he's like, how was your morning? <laughs> and I'm, I about burst. I'm like, hold it together, man, you know? <laughs> and I didn't know what to do because this particular friend was not a believer in Jesus. And I was like, I don't know if he's gonna get it. I don't wanna weird him out. And I just felt like God was saying, just treat him like a friend, just be his friend. And I was like, what does that mean, you know? And I'm like, ah. And I realized if I was hanging out with one of my church buddies and that just happened and they said, how was your morning? I'd be like, God's my friend, you know, and just <laughs> explode my soul all over them, you know? And so that's what I did. I was like, dude, I just had a crazy experience. And I started telling him. And I was like, God's my friend, man. And he showed me through all this stuff. And he's just listening real intently. And, and I get towards the end of the story and he just starts going, wow, wow, man. That is incredible. Wow, wow. And then he starts telling me about a few God experiences he's had and some of the confusion he's had in his life. And he starts asking a few questions and I just start telling him everything God's done in my life. And we didn't record music that morning. We ended up talking for about three hours. And I got to the end of that talk and I was just like, I love this guy so much. And I was like, just, God is so good. I just want you to know what I know. And I want you to experience God like I've experienced him. And I just flat out told him. And I was like, he'll do it for you, man. And you just, Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. And your experiences aren't a coincidence. I was like, it's not a coincidence that I'm here today and telling you all this. Jesus wants to know you and he'll come into your life and he'll guide you and he'll give you the Holy Spirit. But you gotta let him in. He's given us the choice. And I told him the gospel, Jesus died on the cross for you to make it possible. And I said, the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. He's like, all right, I'm coming in. And you're saved in that moment. And the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life. And I said, I don't know where you're at. I don't know where you're at. But if you wanted to do that, I could help you do that. And he said, I, I just, I can't be 100% sure. I just looked at him, I said, it's called faith, man. You'll never be 100% sure. I said, it's, it, it takes trust. You're trusting God with your life. You're saying, I'm trusting you. And I said, he'll never let you down. And if you wanted to trust him today, I would help you pray that prayer. I said, do you wanna do that? And he goes, let's go for it. Yeah. And we prayed together and he accepted Christ that day. This was yesterday, yesterday morning. <laughs> it's crazy. It was awesome. And then I just started fire hosing, like dumping all this information on him, you know, like everything that I could think. And I realized I was, I was like Jesus right before he died on the cross. He's like, I've got much more to say to you, much more than I can now bear. And I'm like, the Holy Spirit's like, he can't handle all this information, <laughs> you know? But I was just so overjoyed. And some people would say, that's a, that's a big coincidence. And I would say, I think not. See, because the first Sunday of this series, when we wrote names on that board over there, I thought of my friend who I loved. 
And he was the first name I wrote on that board over there. And I began praying for him. And I prayed that day, God, save him. God, open up his heart to you in a massive way. I want him to know you like I do. I want him to experience Jesus in his life. And on a weekend, when I planned on telling stories from my college days, it was already written. On a weekend when I started, when I was already planning, talking about providence versus coincidence, God orchestrated all of that and took me on a memory down, a, a journey down memory lane to show me, to show me without a doubt, he's been with me all along. It's not a coincidence you're here this morning. It's God's providence. He's been arranging circumstances and situations in your life for some of you to be here today and maybe for the first time today to open your heart up to Jesus. He is knocking on the door of your life and all you have to do is let him in and confess your faith and say, I'm trusting you with my life. And the Bible says, whoever puts their hope in him will never be put to shame. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, God, I'm so thankful today for your son, Jesus. And I pray right now, God, right now that you would knock on the door of people's hearts who don't know you yet, who've not yet placed their faith in you, Jesus. I pray that, that they would hear. And your, your word says, if anyone today hears his voice, don't harden your hearts. Don't shut the door and lock it. Don't harden your heart against them. He's so good. He wants to come in. You don't have to clean up your life first. He wants to come in and help you clean up your life. You receive him. He comes in and then he lives with you and he helps you through life. He helps you make good decisions. He helps you walk in accordance with his will. You can't walk in accordance with his will apart from him. You need him in your life. And he's knocking on the door so strongly today for some of you. And I just pray today that you would open up your heart and let him in.